Hey everybody, Tommy here with the Fastlane Classics, and today we are talking about one of my all-time favorite vehicles, bar none, the Land Rover Discovery. And we're gonna talk about what makes them so cool, why they are so great on and off-road, and why they could even make great classic car investments going forward. Now, so many of you guys out there love to hate on Land Rover. It's a company that gets so much fury from the online community, but I'm here to tell you today that actually, two discoveries in particular are really great buys. The first generation Discovery and the second generation Land Rover Discovery Series 2. Now believe it or not, the Discovery here in the US is actually on its fifth generation. That's right, over five generations of these old school British off-roaders. And what makes them so special is they are large, comfortable SUVs that look good, are pretty good on-road, and are great off-road. I'd argue that no SUV out there has more character than especially the first and second generation Discovery. Now let's go into a little bit of background on what makes them so special and some of the crazy history behind its founding. You see, Land Rover was founded in the late 1940s, and if we're being honest, the first Land Rovers were largely an aluminum copy of the Willys Jeep, but they sold like hotcakes because they were simple, they were easy to fix, and it is exactly what the UK and actually a lot of Europe needed throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. A basic farm implement in a lot of cases that could be fixed with a hammer and a saw. And in fact, many countries throughout Africa also purchased Land Rovers through agreements with the British government and other means. But Land Rover was really one of the first vehicles to have a prominence throughout the African continent, which is pretty cool to think about. Now, in 1970, Land Rover actually released a much more comfortable and refined luxury off-roader. Now the Range Rover that started off in the 1970s bears little resemblance to the one you can go out and buy today, but it is worth noting that back in the 70s it was so much more superior in terms of comfort on-road design than the old Land Rover series that it too sold really well. So on one end you had the basic utilitarian Land Rover and then on the luxury end of it you had the Range Rover in three and five door models that was more comfortable, more refined for everyday driving and there was largely a huge gap in between the two. Throughout the 1970s Land Rover Range Rover were part of a conglomerate called British Leyland which for a time was actually a government owned auto manufacturer that produced just about every British car you can think of. So MG, Triumph, Jaguar, they were all underneath the umbrella of British Leyland. And what that meant is there really wasn't a lot of money for Land Rover to go out and start developing new products because all the money was being funneled into less successful marks and it was all kind of a mess and it certainly didn't end well. British Leyland was eventually dissolved. However, Land Rover in 1978 was spun off as a separate corporation from British Leyland. So at last, they were able to get financing, able to start investing in some new products, which hadn't been done for many, many years. And immediately there were issues because political water shifted and the African continent, which was buying a lot of Land Rover, suddenly stopped and started buying cheaper and in a lot of cases more reliable Japanese off-roaders, Toyota, Mitsubishi, Nissan, they all started selling throughout Africa. That was a huge market for Land Rover back in the 60s and 70s that quickly dried up, as was the UK because vehicles like the Isuzu Trooper and Mitsubishi Pajero started selling like crazy throughout the UK as well. And Land Rover really didn't have anything to compete with them because on the lower end, they had the old school squared off what is known today as the Defenders. And then they had the luxury Range Rover, but that middle ground was completely barren. So Land Rover had to do something to fill the gap. Project J was launched in 1986 to fill the void between the two extremes. And it was led by a gentleman named Mike Donovan with design lead by a guy named Dave Evans. And the plan was pretty simple. They were gonna use an existing platform to base the design off of the Range Rover. So it used the Range Rover chassis, the Range Rover wheelbase, the Range Rover axles, the Range Rover engine transmission. Underneath, it was gonna be based on its big brother, but of course they couldn't simply just redesign a Range Rover, they had to change around the philosophy a lot. So right from the beginning, it was designed to be a seven seater, a five or a seven seater with a raised roof and a squared off rear end, a station wagon design. Now this presented some issues because if you look at the fuel tank on a Range Rover, it's right in the rear, right where a third row would be. 
which means the third row has to sit higher than the rest of the seating, which means the roof has to be raised. So take a look at some of these early prototypes. You'll see that right from the beginning, it had that high roof, raised roof design, almost like a van. And they actually carried over the Alpine windows, which are these kind of corner windows from the Defender onto the Discovery. There were a number of design options that were considered, some more round, some more squared off until the final design was decided upon. And in just three years, the project went from nothing to fully produced vehicle launching at the Frankfurt Motor Show on September 12th, 1989. And it was actually a pretty revolutionary vehicle at the time. Now, when the Land Rover launched in 1989, believe it or not, it was only optioned as a three-door vehicle, which means there were no rear doors whatsoever. You could only get both front doors and the rear swing gate. And it was actually only available too with this crazy kind of blue interior, which looks very 80s, very retro, but also very cool. There were a number of engines, including a new diesel engine, as well as the old Rover V8, which we'll talk about in a second. The first press drives took place in October of 1989 with a number of prototype vehicles that weren't quite ready for production, if we're being honest. They had a lot of Range Rover parts thrown in throughout the interior, like some had mismatched pedals and mismatched stereos. But it was a pretty huge success right from the onslaught because it was exactly what the UK wanted and it was exactly what Europe wanted as well. And they started selling in droves. Now the five door version, the one that we've come to know today, four doors with the rear uh, tailgate was introduced in autumn of 1990. So it was a year late and that really took off. Now the first generation Discovery pre-facelift models were built from 1989 through about 1994. Four. And they were really cool vehicles not sold in the US. Now the vast majority of you watching are from the US, so we'll get to the ones that you care about that you need to know. The Land Rover Discovery came to the US here in 1994. Per US standards, it had to have airbags. So Land Rover, believe it or not, was actually the first manufacturer, four-wheel drive manufacturer, to offer both driver and passenger airbags. And here in the US, we never got the diesel engines. We never got the three-door model. They were all V8 equipped five-door models. Now, believe it or not, actually, in the early generations here in the US, you could option them with a manual transmission, cloth seats, and no sunroofs. But the ones you'll typically find the vast majority of the time are gonna be leather equipped, sunroof equipped automatic trucks because they were fairly expensive and people wanted them to be nice and cushy and plush. And of course now the newer discoveries are all super luxurious and super kitted out with all the latest and greatest in technology. So even back in the 1990s, those were the ones that sold. So you can find the five speed manual equipped cars, but they're very rare. Now let's talk about the engine that you'd find in the discovery here in the US up through 96. You had a 3.9 liter V8, 96 through 1998, there was a four liter V8. And both of those V8s belong to a family known as the Rover V8. And this is actually a really interesting story because the Rover V8 that you'd buy in 1995 in your discovery would have been a derivative of an old Buick engine from the early 1960s. It was a 215 cubic inch, 3.5 liter, all aluminum block uh, engine that Buick had designed for some of its smaller vehicles. Well, it never really sold that well. It, was, it wasn't all that brilliant here in the US, but the Rover British Leyland Group actually purchased that engine and started using it in their cars throughout the 1970s and 80s. So you could buy, for example, a Triumph with a Rover V8, even an MG with a Rover V8. They were absolutely everything, including the Land Rovers. So it made its way into the Range Rover and then later into the Land Rover Discovery as well. The ones you'd find in the Land Rover Discovery 1 were 3.9 or 4 liters. They were fairly reliable. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Uh, and they continued <laughs> that engine all the way up in the Discovery through 2004. So if you went and bought a brand new Discovery back in the early 2000s, your engine has a lot in common with the early 1960s Buick. That is actually a really fun fact. Now, one of the coolest aspects of the Discovery is its off-road capability because it was based on the Range Rover, which back in the early 70s, as we recall, was actually built for off-road use which means it has a solid axle in the front, a solid axle in the rear, and an old school ladder chassis. These were built tough, they were built rugged, and they were built to last. Some of the cool features of the Land Rover Discoveries are actually the axles, which are positioned off to one side, 
and they're both in a line, which means if you avoid a rock with the front differential, the front pumpkin, you're actually going to avoid it in the rear as well. And they are a full-time four-wheel drive system, which was quite expensive to produce and engineer. So rather than having a lever to go from too high to four high to four low, the discoveries were always in four-wheel drive high which meant that when you were living in snowy environments, there was no lever you needed to pull, nothing you needed to worry about. You simply drove it as you would every single day. And then there was an option for four low as well. They also all came with center differential locks because if you have a center differential, when you go around turns, the front and the rear drive shaft spin at different speeds so you don't crab and don't cause excessive wear. But the issue with that is if you get stuck off road, they get really stuck really fast. So by locking over that center differential, you could distribute the torque evenly 50 50 front and rear very very tough off-road vehicles and this was demonstrated in something called the camel trophy series of events where the discovery took part between 1990 and 1997. Now the Camel Trophy events were some absolutely crazy challenges and it was actually a competition set up by Land Rover and Camel to promote both of the products. And they were typically held in crazy environments like Mongolia, Siberia, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout South America. They were expeditions, usually a couple weeks, and teams from around the world would compete in various Land Rovers, and there would be a number of challenges. But basically, check out some of the old videos on YouTube. It's insane what they would do to these Land Rovers. They would beat the crud out of them for weeks on end. They'd break, they'd tip them over on their side to fix things on the underside. I mean, just, some of the craziest expeditions you'll ever see in your entire life, driving up to water four feet high, but it really proved that the Discovery was built tough. It was built to go off-road. Now, the first year competed in 1990, uh, took place in Siberia, then 90, 91, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It also competed in various events, and then in 97, the final one was in Mongolia, where the Discovery competed, and then it turned into the G4 Challenge and got a little bit less cool, but the Camel Trophy vehicles are some of the craziest competition, like I said, you'll ever see. Now, the Discovery sold well here in the US. Once again, though, Land Rover at the time didn't really have a lot of money and the money they did have went into developing new um, engine factories as well as the Range Rover finally got updated in the late 90s as a P38. So by 1998, the Land Rover Discovery, at least worldwide, was going on 10 years old. It was time for a refresh. It was actually time for a full redo, but the company just didn't really have the money to put into a new project. So when the Discovery Series 2 came along, they had to do something. Now the Discovery Series 2 internal name was called Project Tempest and it was sold between 99 and 2004. Now during this period when they were developing the Discovery 2, uh, ownership of Land Rover Range Rover went to BMW. That was actually a kind of an interesting period, I don't remember this, but BMW owned the Land Rover Range Rover group for a while as well. And BMW said, you know what, we're going to stop development of our own SUV and devote a lot of resources and engineering toward this Discovery 2. Well, that really, that just did not happen. That was not the case. Land Rover had no money to develop the Land Rover Discovery 2, so they had to get a little bit creative. One of the big issues with the first generation Discoveries, even though it could be had in three rows of seating, the third row was pretty terrible. It was pretty cramped. The vehicle needed to be extended. So. In order to do that, you really should extend the wheelbase, come up with a new platform, but they didn't have the money. So they took the existing architecture and just added a bit in the rear, which kind of ruined the departure angle, kind of made the styling a little bit funky, but that's what they did. They also wanted to change the styling, but once again, there wasn't really a lot of money to do that. So a lot of the style looks super, super similar to the Discovery 1. The easiest way to tell an early Discovery 2 from the Discovery 1 was the high mounted taillights, but in the front they look almost identical. I have a really hard time distinguishing the two. Door handles are different, the rear side windows were now uh, infused into the body versus an old school gasket, so there were some small things. Interiors were improved a little bit, but largely the Discovery 2s were an update to the Discovery 1s, but there were some improvements. So the 4 liter was updated a little bit. It was now called the Thor line of engines. It had a stiffer frame. The rear suspension was changed to use a Watts link, and one of the complaints of the Discovery 1, it was very tippy on the road. Well, Land Rover pioneered something called ACE, or Active Cornering Enhancement, to fix the handling to stop the roll. Basically, this was a hydraulically operated sway bar that would firm up on the road so it didn't tip around as much around turns. It was an option here in the US. You could also get rear air springs, so when you towed and the rear end would sag, you could lift it back up. 
pretty cool stuff back in the late 90s, but once again, it was all developed on a shoestring. One of the big things that the Discovery 2 pioneered was traction control ABS and hill descent control. So the old Discovery 1s had a center diff lock, the early Discovery 2s actually didn't. Land Rover went away from that completely, rather they relied on ABS wheel speed sensors to brake wheels that were spinning to send power to wheels with traction. It was all right, the hill descent control was cool, but early Discovery 2s aren't as good off-road as Discovery 1s because they don't have the center diff lock. Now, funny enough, in kind of shoestring engineering here, Land Rover kept the center diff lock mechanism in the transfer case, but they didn't give you a way to engage it. So some owners actually convert their Discovery 2s to locking center diffs through a special linkage, but from the factory, that was never the case. And eventually in 2003, it was facelifted to be more in line with the brand new Range Rover at the time. And this was a big improvement in design in my opinion, but it also got a new engine. So the engine went from a four liter to a 4.6 liter. And then in 2004, Land Rover finally relented and brought the um, center differential lock back actually. So the 04s are a little bit more desirable than the early ones. But both the Discovery 1s and 2s are very off-road capable. There's a lot of aftermarket parts. They both had solid axles, so they're both easily liftable. Front bumpers, roof racks, all of that is easily available. And this was kind of the last old school discovery starting in the LR3. They went to independent suspension and air springs and unibody construction. But Discovery 1s and 2s are decidedly old school, which I think is really cool. Now, what are some of the problems? Well, in my opinion, if you're looking at getting one of these vehicles, the Series 1 are better than the Series 2 for a number of reasons. They were a little bit simpler. For example, that ABS traction control hill ascent always failed on the Discovery 2s and left a problem that was so prevalent it actually got a nickname called the Three Amigos because <laughs> ABS hill ascent and traction control lights would engage on the dashboard and then you lost all three of those altogether. That was a big issue. On the 4.6 liter equipped vehicles, head gasket failures were such a problem. Uh, they were a problem on some of the early ones as well, but especially in 03 and 04, head gasket failures were not an if, they were a when. And there's a lot of theories to this, but one of the most common theories is that the, uh, the engine dates back to the 1960s, as we mentioned. First of all, a lot of the moldings were quite old by 2003 and 2004, but it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So it went from a 3.5 to a 3.9, and then a four liter, and then a 4.2, and then a 4.6, but the block didn't really change. So the cylinders kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the cylinders get bigger and bigger and bigger, the cylinder walls get smaller and smaller and smaller between the cylinders, which means there's less and less head gasket. And then that would tend to leak over time and even in some cases, not a lot of time at all. Some owners report head gasket failures within 50,000 miles, 60,000 miles. The other issues on those engines are slipped liners. So it was an all aluminum block, all aluminum head, and then a steel cylinder liner. Well, as the engine would start to overheat, as they sometimes did, especially when head gaskets would fail, things would expand and contract, and the liners would actually slip out of their uh, housings and they would start moving up and down with the cylinders. Big issue, big issue. So the Discovery ones typically don't have as many problems. The 3.9 and the 4 liters are a little bit more robust even though they're basically the same engine. Other issues that Discovery 2s had, they had uh, front drive shafts that would sometimes explode which would take out the transmission housing and ruin the transmission. So the Discovery ones are probably going to be the ones to get. Now for many many years the Discoveries, especially the ones were just cheap transportation or potentially off-roaders. They were fairly disposable. People would buy them and throw them away. But recently we've seen an explosion in the classic truck and SUV market. Even vehicles like the Cherokee XJs have just exploded in value. I have a video which I'll link in the description below if you want to see my uh, analysis on that. And I think that's going to start bringing up the prices of the discoveries. Range Rover Classics, which the vehicle is based on, have seen uh, increases in prices in the last few years. The Discovery, which is a little bit, you know, less posh than the Range Rover, is also, in my opinion, going to start seeing some increases if you hold on long enough. So, in terms of investment, you can get into a Discovery one for maybe four or five grand, depending on where you live, and I think it's not a bad investment. Have a lot of fun with it off-road, really enjoy it, appreciate the stepped-up roof line, and just the adventurous feeling you get when you drive one of these, and then sell it on later when the economy improves, and you might be able to make a little bit of a profit.
This green one that you've seen running around is ours. We had it for a number of years and it was just fantastic to drive. Every time you get into it, you sit so high above the ground. Um, it's got something called the command driving position where they actually raise the seats up so you look down on the world and you just feel like you're on safari going to the grocery store. I love the way that Discoveries drive. Strongly recommend it. And you know, reliability, not gonna be Toyota levels, but especially on the ones, I think you're fine. They're very simple. There's not a whole lot to go wrong, especially if you get one without sunroofs and a manual transmission, and they're definitely worth looking into buying. Well, as always, this has been Tommy with the Fastlane Classics. Head over to TFL Classics for the latest and greatest in Land Rover Discovery reviews.